O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it well. My frame was not hidden from you, when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance, in your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I am still with you. O that you would slay the wicked, O God! O men of blood, depart from me! They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your kindness and your mercy and your truth. We pray that you would move now by your Spirit in accordance with your Word, that we'd be a people who would know you, we'd know ourselves, and we'd marvel at your wonder. We pray this for our good, we pray this for your glory, and we pray this in the precious name of Jesus and all of God's people said with one super loud voice, Amen. Amen. Hey man, welcome City on a Hill. Wonderful to be with you. Can we put our hands together and thank our fathers who are here and thank you guys, thankful for you. And keep that applause going for spring, first weekend. We made it. You made it. Praise be to the Lord. Well, uh, on the 29th of May, 2014, Time Magazine released a cover story featuring the one and only Laverne Cox. Uh, It's nothing new, of course, for Time Magazine to feature a glamorous model, but what made this a history-making cover story is that it was the first to ever feature an openly, uh, an actress who was openly transgender. Uh, Raised in uh, Alabama, uh, Laverne recognized at a young age uh, that she was attracted to her male classmates, faced years of bullying for what she described as not acting the way someone assigned male at birth was supposed to act. Uh, She since rose to fame fame with that starring role in Orange is the New Black, and she was actually awarded Woman of the Year by Glamour magazine, who said that uh, Cox teaches us that gender identity lives first and foremost in our hearts and minds. Soon after, uh, Vanity Fair followed with a cover story featuring the former uh, Olympic gold medalist titled Call Me Caitlin. Uh, It was the magazine's uh, highest-selling cover story for five years. Later that same year, Hollywood released a movie called The Danish Girl uh, featuring the true story of Libby Elby, one of the earliest sex reassignment patients. And that was followed by a feature-length documentary by the National Geographic called Gender Revolution that featured a a nine-year-old boy who identified as a girl. 
Of course, uh, the rise of transgenderism isn't limited to the film and television industry. In 2014, the book I Am Jazz uh, told the story of Jazz Jennings, who at age two expressed she was a, had a girl's brain in a boy's body. The book was published and marketed to schools across America for preschool students through to third grade. Closer to home, schools in Australia were introduced to new teaching aids. The genderbred person uh, teaches that people have five characteristics uh, falling along a spectrum. Their identity, uh, which is how you define your gender based on how you feel. The second is expression, which is how you present your gender based on what you wear and your actions. Sex is defined as the physical sex characteristics uh, 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 that you were born with. And the last concerns, the last two concerns, sexual attraction and orientation. Uh, you won't be surprised to hear that the genderbred person came under fierce criticism. Uh, the activists uh, revealed that, uh, took, uh, uh, took criticism at the fact that it was overtly, if we can keep the other one up just for a moment, took criticism with the fact uh, that it looked too overtly male, uh, and they didn't like the term physical sex. And that's what led to the next slide, which is the gender unicorn. Uh, the gender unicorn, as you can see, is perhaps a little less male uh, but they also changed um, physical sex to sex assigned at birth. Now, that was a small but significant shift in the debate, which articulates that sex is no longer kind of a, uh, a, 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 is not a biological reality, but something that's imposed on you as a social construct. Uh, in Australia, we also saw the government got behind the Safe Schools uh, Coalition, uh, safe schools were lobbying teachers and students to create schools as a safe place for the LGBTI community, uh, and this included new curriculum plus a whole host of posters uh, which kind of promoted uh, diversity and sexual orientation and gender. They also encouraged schools to establish a, a rainbow crossing as you enter the schools to have uh, same-sex attracted or gender diverse formals, as well as the introduction of gender neutral toilets. Now, no laws currently enforce gender-neutral bathrooms, uh, but the South Australian government just recently was the first to approve a new policy which allowed students to use toilets of the gender they identify with. Uh, interestingly, uh, activism is also raising questions for parents and their role in supporting a child's uh, gender. Uh, so just this year in Ohio, uh, parents of a child lost custody of their child because they wouldn't affirm uh, their child's desire to have sex hormone treatment and they wouldn't refer to their child by their preferred name and so they lost custody of their child. Uh, this move, as you know, is also having widespread impact on the business sector. Uh, of course, Facebook, the largest social media network, uh, introduced uh, new options when you establish your profile. Uh, you can now choose from 71 different gender terms to describe yourself. Uh, and interestingly, they were working with the LGBTI community and discovered that 71 gender options was too limiting for people, and so they now have created another category, which is a free flow sentiment, where you can create your own gender. Uh, Qantas have kind of followed a similar sentiment, uh, introducing new legislation for all their staff, uh, that going forward, that they uh, would prefer that people do not um, uh, identify people as male or female or husband or wife or mother or father, but you use more uh, inclusive terms like partner and spouse or parent. Uh, in the sporting industry, uh, many are also wondering how do we cater for transgender people in an age of equality? Uh, in February, the AFL accepted transgender footballer Hannah Mouncey uh, to play in the Women's State League. Inclusion and social media manager Tanya Hosh said, we want all Australians to be able to participate in our game. And then there's the church. This year, uh, journalist Julia Baird introduced Australia's first transgender priest. Uh, Dr. Joe Inkpin uh, featured there on the right, next to her wife, Penny, who's also an Anglican priest, serves at a parish in Brisbane. Uh, this public, or Inkpin's tr public transition came on the back of a motion from the Church of England 
uh, which called for transgender people to be affirmed and that bishops establish a nationally approved liturgy to mark a person's transition. Uh, And while there's much that could be said, much more that could be said about this cultural change and this cultural landscape that we are in, it's, it's clear, isn't it, that Time magazine were right when they said that we have reached and indeed surpassed a transgender tipping point. It's not to say that transgender is something new, but in the space of just a few short years, it has leapt from the periphery of public consciousness to the very center of pop pop culture and the political arena. And significantly, we must keep in mind that when we're talking about being transgender, we're not just talking about something that is political, but is for some of us also profoundly personal. So I remember when I was 14 years of age, uh, receiving a phone call from my guitar teacher, Michael. Uh, He was a classic kind of heavy metal guitarist who taught me how to slay like Van Halen. And he called me up over the summer break and he said, Guy, when you return to your lessons next term, you'll notice some changes. I think to myself, new, new lesson times, new curriculum, new fees. He says, Guy, I'm having a sex change. Do you know what that means? And immediately I said, no. I don't know why I said that. I think it was the shock of the phone call. But he spent the next 15 minutes explaining to me how he'd always felt like a woman trapped in a man's body. And so, sure enough, the next time I went to my guitar lesson and put my Fender Strat down, uh, where there once was, you know, a Guns N' Roses t-shirt was now a free-flowing floral dress, where there was the metal hair and the facial stubble was now uh, straightened hair and uh, nail polish, where there was Michael was now Michelle. Now, I'll be honest, I was conflicted, a little confused, and I had questions. And to be honest, I still have questions. Is it a big deal if a man wants to be a woman, or a woman wants to be a man? Perhaps we should just all recognize that the world's changed. It's a new day. It's a new world. And perhaps we need to look at this world and ourselves with a new lens. Now, in a moment, we are going to consider what God says to our world about identity and gender fluidity and what it means to be transgender. But I have, I'm convinced that we need to spend some time actually considering this topic that is before us. Uh, I don't stand here today as an expert. Uh, I've spent months uh, thinking and researching and praying, and what I've realized is very complex what we're talking about here. And so I thought it'd be incredibly important that we spend time unpacking this issue that is before us. So to begin, I want us to consider the T in LGBTIQA+. What does it actually mean to be transgender? Uh, Lily Edelstein, writing for the ABC, says, transgender people are people who believe that their gender identities are different to the gender they were assigned at birth. In our medical system, most babies born are categorized as male or female based on their physical characteristics. For many people, however, the gender they are assigned is not the identity that actually exists within them, though they are not broken, mismatched, or strange. Now, you can see by that definition that when we're talking about being transgender, we're not talking necessarily about sexual orientation. You can also see that being transgender is distinct from intersex. Intersex is the chromosomes or genitals aren't distinct, and it refers to those of us whose chromosomes or genitals aren't distinctly male or female at birth. And this physical condition, which is very, very rare, can express itself in Many ways, such as the formation of two sets of sex organs or ambiguous external genitalia. Now, that's different to being transgender. 
In trans, when we're talking about transgender, we're talking about a person who is born with a typical male or typical female anatomy, but feel they're in the wrong body. Now, for some people, that disharmony between their mind and body is a passing thought or a controllable thought, but for others, it's a consistent and consuming thought. It leads to despair, it leads to great stress, it leads to feelings of isolation. And historically, that was called gender identity disorder. Today, it's called uh, gender dysphoria. Here's how one person facing gender dysphoria describes the experience. Have you ever been homesick? Like really homesick? Feeling like you need to be home now. You want your bed. You want to be around your puppy. You need to feel safe and secure in a familiar place. It's like that all the time but you can't go home. In fact, you don't even know where this home is. What causes gender dysphoria? Uh, Well, there is much debate and research going on, answering that question right now, or seeking to. Uh, Some believe that the most significant contribution is nature. Uh, Robert Sapolsky, a biologist, claims that some are born with a male-type brain in a woman's body, and vice versa. This neurobiological theory has gained popular attention uh, in the media today and support even in the scientific community. However, uh, it's important to say that it's not without criticism. Uh, Dr. Lawrence Meyer, a biostatistic biostatistician, I went to public school, I have trouble with these words, believes that uh, current research for the neurobiological theory hasn't demonstrated whether any observed differences are causes or effects of transgender identification. In other words, the findings don't tell us whether transgender identities are innate and fixed or subject to environmental forces. Uh, another critique of the nature theory uh, comes from Paul, uh, Professor Paul uh, Hughes, who cites studies on identical twins. Uh, he makes the case that if transgender identity were innate, then two children who came from the same womb and share in the same genetic makeup would both be transgender or neither would. But that isn't what the research indicates. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum is the theory that gender is primarily a social construct. That is to say that it's not about nature, it's all about nurture. Um, A pioneer of this theory was uh, Dr. John Money. Uh, Money taught uh, that we're born with an unformed sense of being male or being female, and that up until the first two years of life, all brains are malleable, and therefore, you have 24 months where you can train the brain, you can train a baby to believe itself to be a boy or to be a girl. Significantly, Money's research on gender theory is one of the most cited, dominant, foundational views that uh, has led to uh, this cultural moment and this view on social theory. However, Money's theory did come under scrutiny, uh, particularly with a case involving a young boy named Bruce Reamer. A very sad story, actually. Bruce was born biological male with an identical twin. However, at just seven months of age, there was a surgical mishap in his circumcision and his penis was destroyed. And Dr. Money and his team advised the family involved that sexual reassignment coupled with this gender reinforcement would be the best course of action. And so they changed his name from Bruce to Deborah. They dressed him in a cute little dress. They got him to play with girls' toys and encouraged him to help his mother to bake cookies. And then they began genital reconstruction. When Brenda reached six years of age, Money reported to the world at large that it had been a great success and therefore a glowing endorsement uh, of his gender theory. However, in reality, 
Brenda grew up and knew that something was wrong. Um, at 14, continuing to express a personal difficulty, the parents finally told him the truth uh, about his birth, his biological sex, and took the name. Uh, he reversed from being Deborah to taking on his biological sex and took the name David. Uh, but David struggled. He struggled with relationships. He struggled with unemployment. He struggled with the death of his twin brother who overdosed on antidepressants. And in his mid-30s, he committed suicide. Very tragic story. And while it is only one story in, in many that could be told, uh, it appears that the research and discussion into the causes of gender dysphoria are inconclusive. It's too early, perhaps, in the debate. Um, Mark Yarhouse, a professor of psychology at Regent, says, an appropriate amount of humility can be found in saying, we don't know what causes gender dysphoria. That said, when it comes to treating those with gender dysphoria, there are currently two main distinct and very different causes of response or modes of response. The first, which is what we would hear most in culture today, is affirmative therapy. Uh, affirmative therapy is listening to the desires and the feelings of a child based on their agenda. So they may be biological male, but she, he, she expresses that she is a girl. Affirmative therapy will encourage parents, encourage doctors to recognize that feeling and support a transition towards their inner felt identity. Um, this begins with a social transition where a child is given a new name, a new wardrobe, and is treated as a child of the opposite sex. Second, uh, a child will be placed on puberty blockers to prevent the normal process of development. Uh, historically, you, wouldn't, you, you couldn't do that without the family court's approval, uh, but with, uh, you would have known the young Australian of the year, uh, Georgie Stone, who herself is um, a transgendered, uh, led to a kind of a pivotal case where she had puberty blockers at the age of 10, making it now uh, available to all kids in Australia as well, with their parents' support. Uh, third, around 16, comes the administration of cross-sex hormones. Uh, estrogen helps those who are biological male develop breasts at a more feminine shape, and testosterone is given to those who are biological, biologically female and leads to a lower voice, facial hair, a reduction in breast tissue, and the enlargement of the clitoris. The final step is sex reassignment surgery. Uh, this involves uh, the removal or reshaping of primary and secondary sex characteristics and plastic surgery to create male or female looking sex characteristics. So that's affirmative therapy. In contrast, there is reparative therapy. Uh, unlike affirmative therapy, uh, which works to align uh, the body to the mind, reparative therapy seeks to align the mind to the body. And it's based on the belief that a person's gender isn't a social construct or isn't fluid, but it's a biological reality determined by our genes and our anatomy. And so where a person feels dysphoria, reparative therapy seeks to help the person become more comfortable in their biological sex. Those of this view will cite other um, conditions of the mind, like anorexia, where someone sees themselves as an overweight person when in reality they're physically underweight, they will suggest that the starting point of treatment is not liposuction, but is to help them recognize that feelings are not always the same as reality. Uh, personally, I had someone very close to me who suffered from an identity disorder. Uh, true story, he was convinced he was Michael Jackson. Uh, he spoke like Michael would speak. He uh, had a similar wardrobe. He had the glove. He could do the moonwalk. 
uh, uh, he, he, he wasn't just a, a fan who admired Michael. No, he genuinely felt, believed he was Michael, to the point that if you didn't address him as Michael Jackson, he would give you a very puzzled face. What do you do with that? Well, clearly you want to show love and compassion, but does love and compassion mean I am to affirm his expressed identity? Should I encourage him to fully transition to Michael, get the skin-dying treatment, the plastic surgery to match how he feels inside? Now, clearly, there's differences and complexities here, but as is the case with gender dysphoria, the path of reparative therapy works with an individual to help align thoughts and feelings with the biological reality. And a key part in that is trying to understand a person's individual story and what perhaps has led to their feeling of dysphoria. Uh, There's a guy named Dr. Kenneth Zucker, who's one of the most uh, frequently cited names in research on gender identity, and he was particularly interested in understanding why children and their parents were coming to the clinics and requesting uh, or expressing uh, a, a desire for gender transition. And he made some fascinating discoveries. I can't share it all with us today, clearly, but some fascinating stories. For example, uh, there was a girl named Rose who came to his clinic at age nine uh, wearing a boyish haircut, clothes, and a long and consistent desire to be a boy. Uh, Sad story. When she was four years of age, Rose found her mother's body dead at the bottom of a staircase, and she'd been killed by her boyfriend. Rose was then adopted at age six, but the trauma of her mother's death stayed with her and fueled this fantasy of wanting to be a boy. And during the assessment, Rose commented that she wanted to be a boy because boys are stronger than girls. And she told her adoptive mother that when they walk down the street, she need not be afraid because I look like a boy and no one will hurt you. And so in this instance, you can see that Zucker and his team recognized that this was actually a post-traumatic stress disorder and that he needed, with the help of the team and the family, to help her recognize, number one, that she had some rigid definitions of gender, firstly, but that she'd created a fantasy solution to deal with her mother's loss. And while this and other forms of reparative therapy are deemed unethical today and cruel, I I hope you can realize or see that it comes from a similar position of love and a desire for health and well-being. On both sides of the debate are people who genuinely, it sounds, care. Um, And those of reparative therapy believe this is actually the best course of action that would lead to health and well-being. Uh, Interestingly, in Australia today, they say that 1.2% of Australian school children, which is about 45,000 students, um, will express some sense of gender dysphoria or identify as transgender. And yet what you very rarely hear in the debate is that somewhere between 80 and 95% of those children will align to their their, their, their birth gender Uh, as they grow up, that is, as puberty takes course, as they develop, they realign back to what they were born with. Uh, That's significant. I mean, that's not going to happen if someone goes on puberty blockers, but that's uh, that's a finding of a major study on gender research. In addition, while the media is also keen to spotlight success stories like Laverne Cox and Caitlyn Jenner, what we rarely hear about are the real living stories of people who've made the transition, and rather than alleviating their distress, it's only added to their sense of isolation, pain, and discomfort. Uh, In Ryan Anderson's book, uh, When Harry Became Sally, uh, he recaps the story of of a woman named Kari Stella, who posts a YouTube clip in 2016 telling her story. She says, I'm Kari, and I'm a 22-year-old detransitioned woman. 
I transitioned uh, socially at 15, started hormones at 17, had a double mastectomy at 20, and I detransitioned just after my 22nd birthday. Kari stresses the reason for her detransition was not that people didn't accept her as trans. She says that by all appearances, she was a success story, but her inner life was something different. She says, the truth is, a lot of women don't feel like they have options. When you tell a therapist that you have those kinds of feelings, they don't tell you it's okay to be butch, to be gender non-conforming, to not like men, to not like the way men treat you. They don't tell you there are other women who feel like they don't belong. They tell you about testosterone. Kara adds, Kari adds, uh, when I was on testosterone, I wanted to change my name. Once I changed my name, I wanted a mastectomy. Once I had a mastectomy, I wanted a hysterectomy, bottom surgery, and so on. Transition didn't really make my dysphoria better. It just kept moving the goalposts, so I felt like I was making progress, but I never got any closer to where I wanted to be. And she concludes with these words. I'm a real, live 22-year-old woman with a scarred chest, and a broken voice, and a five o'clock shadow, because I couldn't face the idea of growing up to be a woman. That's my reality. Now, I hope at this point, you, like me, can see that what we're talking about is complex. It's complex, it's new for our culture, uh, it's complex in terms of the various responses that exists in society today. That said, as we consider this topic, I want us to now spend some time looking at what the Bible says to our world, what God says to our world about gender fluidity and being transgender. And the first insight is to affirm what we have heard throughout this series, and that is that all people are made by God. All people are made by God. Genesis 1, 27, God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. It's important to recognize that we are right now in a unique time in history, a time where more and more people are turning their back on past traditions, and the expectations of the past in pursuit of a new cultural narrative that is marked by fierce independence, individualism, authenticity, and self-expression. And what that means is that truth, meaning, and identity is actually something you create. It doesn't matter to our culture what truth you hold, or what life you pursue, or what identity you express, what matters to our culture is that you are true to yourself. But this is where the Bible presents a countercultural and compelling vision for humanity, because it reveals that truth, meaning, and identity are not fluid, they are not subjective constructs built on the conveyor belt of human experience but are created and given by a good and loving God. The Bible reveals that we don't define our lives or our identity. We are first and foremost to see ourselves as created beings made by God. In art, this could be the difference between Monet and Mr. Squiggle. It's a ridiculous illustration, but, but come with me. Uh, who remembers Mr. Squiggle? Everyone. All right, great. So, Mr. Squiggle receives a few random lines, the page is then turned upside down, and then he has the task to create his own picture. And he has fun with it, and he does whatever he wants, and sometimes he comes up with a duck, or a house, or a boat. This will sound ridiculous, but it's actually not too dissimilar to how our culture is currently seeing truth and identity. We're each presented with a few lines to work with, but our job is to create our own picture, to form our own meaning, to mark out our own value and create our own identity. 
And you can see, can't you, why that's appealing? I get control. You can see why that is overwhelming. What if I get the picture wrong? What if my feelings change? But this is where Mr. Squiggle is vastly different to Monet. No one in their right mind goes to a gallery with a paintbrush in hand, ready to paint over a Monet. No, when you see Madame Monet, the intended goal is that you stand in awe and admire the beauty. And so it is with us. The first and fundamental response to our humanity is that we marvel at the beauty of God's good design. Whether you're a man or woman, whether you're a woman who feels like a man or a man who feels like a woman, God says, you're a work of art. You're not an accident. Uh, You're not a product of society. You're made in my image. You're crowned with my glory and honor. I love how the psalmist expresses this. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully, wonderfully made. You know, throughout ancient religion, there has been a tendency for people to elevate the spirit over and against the body. And actually, when you look at culture today, you see something of the resurgence of this Gnostic idea that wants to define or even reduce humanity to what we are inside. But this is where the Bible presents a far richer vision for life. When God made you, He gifted you with a mind to think and a heart to feel, but also a body to move. And this was all part of His glorious, creative, beautiful design. And recognizing that we are embodied creatures helps us not only honor the value in each other, but the unique significance of being made male and female. Right? Because God didn't just create humanity. No, the Bible says He created us male and female. Now, we've seen that there's profound sameness between the man and the woman. But there's also profound distinction. And while there's countless studies looking at that distinction and how that distinction is expressed, a fundamental distinction between the man and the woman is our biology. Uh, Will we always feel at home in the body? No. Will there be times of doubt in our gender or even despair at our sexuality? Absolutely. But knowing we've been formed by a good and loving God with inherent value and unique significance as a man and as a woman should suggest caution when it comes to reordering what God has put together. And I believe this is where our understanding of gender and our struggles with identity must be viewed in light of Genesis 1, but also... Genesis 3. You see, in Genesis 3, we find that Adam and Eve lose sight of God's goodness. Instead of trusting their God, they swallow a lie. And the Bible teaches us that the moment they turned their back on God, the moment they disobeyed God, they plunged themselves and this world into chaos, disorder, and even death. A death that not only marred their relationship with God, but even marred the relationship they had within themselves. It's not that It's not that from that point on they couldn't love anymore. They could love, it's just that now they would also be met with feelings of fear. It's not that they they couldn't be pure... 
It's just now that in sin, their mind would be so often consumed by lust. It's not that they couldn't trust God, believe in God. It's just that in sin, their heart is now divided. Instead of giving themselves completely to their Creator, they so often are bent in towards themselves. And it is this disharmony that was brought into their lives that you and I have walked in ever since. The world is not as it should be. Life is not as it should be. We are all marred spiritually, relationally. We are all marred internally and we are all marred and broken physically. Today, that a hospital room in the city, a mother gives birth to a baby girl, and there's balloons and celebration. And yet down the hall is another room where a mother is informed of a child being born with a heart condition that needs immediate support. Out in the suburbs, three young boys are on their BMX, riding through the streets, enjoying the spring sun, while another boy looks out from the window, trying to come to terms with the loss of movement in his legs. And as one wife picks up the phone and rejoices at the news that her husband's results are clear, another wife opens the door to a local police officer who informs her of a major accident and that her husband is never coming home. This is our world. This world is a precious yet painful paradox. It is a tale of two cities. It is an existence where all of us walk with one foot in Genesis 1 and the other firmly planted in Genesis 3. And I'm convinced that this is why we as Christians can and should find great unity with those of us who are struggling with their questions of gender and identity. Because of all people, we know that on this side of heaven, none of us are at home in our body or this world. And so rather than pretending that everything is okay, we as God's people are compelled to give voice to the full orchestra of human emotion. That is to say that we are to rejoice with those who rejoice, but also weep with those who weep. If you are struggling in life, struggling in your identity, I want you to know that as a church, we won't stand on some high top mountain pointing down at your pain and your difficulty. No, we are compelled by God to enter into the valley and walk with you. We won't always have the right words. We won't always respond in the right ways. But where there is isolation, we are to be there and offer friendship. Where there is distress, we are to be there with you and offer comfort. Where there is confusion, we are there to be a voice of truth. And where there are the dark clouds of distress, despair, we as God's people are to walk with you and point you to the good news of God's hope. That in God there is healing, in God there is freedom, in God there is hope. And while we could have a long conversation about hope, I want you to know today, believe today, that the clearest, most beautiful expression of God's hope has been revealed to us in Jesus. This week I was reading um, a great story of one of Jesus' followers, Philip. Uh, who was making his way uh, when the Spirit told him to go and and, and take a road towards Gaza. Um, And as he's traveling, Philip sees a chariot uh, coming his way. And uh, 
we discover that the man inside this chariot is an Ethiopian man who's returning from Jerusalem, which is the heartland of uh, Israel, God's people Israel. And, and, and the Ethiopian's clearly not an Israelite himself, but for whatever reason, he has great affinity and affection for the God of Israel. And, and the plot thickens when we discover that this Ethiopian is also a eunuch who served as a court official for the queen. Um, in those days, a eunuch served the crown, providing oversight for women uh, and often the harem. And it was often the case uh, that kings and queens didn't want their servants getting distracted or their women pregnant, and so eunuchs were more often than not castrated. It may have happened in birth, but often this was a later procedure. And while we can't be sure, I, I, it seems to me that the eunuch you know, would have found great value and significance in his role before the queen, and yet at the same time must have journeyed and recognized the great cost. Uh, much like today, the pinnacle of the good life in ancient Israel was to get married, have children, and, and raise a family. What's more, the Bible has clear prohibitions that made it almost impossible for people like the eunuch to enter into the, the presence of God. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 23 says this, No one whose testicles are crushed or whose male organ is cut off shall enter the assembly of the Lord. Just ask yourself what it would have been like for the eunuch to, to read that how it is that he could reconcile his great love for God with his own reality, his own body. Well, as the char uh, chariot approached, Philip hears the eunuch reading the Bible. And he overhears him reading from Isaiah chapter 53, which is a prophecy concerning the suffering servant, the one God would send to our world to redeem and restore it. The eunuch invites Philip into the chariot, shows him Isaiah 53, and says, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or someone else? I love this. Philip opened his mouth and beginning with the Scriptures, he told him about the good news about Jesus. He told him the good news about Jesus. Don't you love that? Here in this chariot, the eunuch discovers that this ancient prophecy, this promise of salvation, has now been realized in God's Son, Jesus, the one who was led like a lamb to the slaughter is Jesus, the one sent by God is Jesus. And Philip says to the eunuch, this is good news. Why is this good news for the eunuch? It's good news in part, isn't it? Because here in Jesus, he sees someone who would know his pain. He would know that Jesus entered into the futility. He would know in Jesus that there was one who was ridiculed. Here is one who was rejected. Here is one who had his identity questioned. Here is one who was riddled with anxiety and at times wrestled with his own calling. And yet here in Jesus, he saw one who conquered the grave, who came not only to lay down his life, but to pick up his life and to make that life available for all. That in Jesus, there is good news of hope, there is good news of healing, there is good news of life and love. I love what happens next in the story. As they see a stream of water, the eunuch says, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him there and then. Don't you love the courage and the boldness? He's not waiting for a convenient hour. He's not, well, I've got to sort out a few things. No, he's like, I'm diving into the waters of Christ right now. It's glorious, because as he dives into the waters of Christ, he immerses, he immerses himself into God's glory and God's forgiveness and God's grace and God's mercy, and as he comes out of that water, he comes out what? New. 
a new identity. The Apostle Paul says, look, there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, does this negate the significance of our nationality or erase our gender? No, but it does herald the good news that in Christ we are gifted with a new identity that transcends us all. That's the good news of the gospel. If you are here today as a Christian and you are wanting to know how you can best love your family member or friend who is in the LGBTI community, I trust and pray that first and foremost you would see them as being made in God's image, crowned with His glory. You would know that eternity has been placed on their heart, that you wouldn't see them just as a label. You'd recognize that they're made for God, recognize to know and receive the good news of the gospel. And if you are here today as someone who is struggling with your own questions of identity, struggling in life, oh, it's no accident that you're here. Oh, that you would know that in the same way that God pursued this man on the road, God is pursuing you right now with the good news of Jesus. That there is life in His name. There is freedom in His name. There is hope in His name. I'll finish with a quote from Cy Rogers. Uh, Cy grew up with a challenging and difficult upbringing and for many of his years identified as a woman felt more at home in being a woman and began a transition and lived as a woman for a few years. And yet as he was lost in his identity, somehow he stumbled into a church community and there he was met with love. There he encountered community and there he got to hear the good news about Jesus and explains how that good news transformed his life. And he says these words, which we'll finish with. He says, For years I was subjected to the opinions of others. Their words, labels, and judgments convinced me who I was and what I was. That is until the day, above the fray, God's voice called me to Himself. He told me who I was and whose I was. Men and women of City on a Hill, do you know to whom you belong? Do you know... The glory, the beauty, the life, the identity that is yours in Christ. Let's take a moment to go to Him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank You for Your goodness and Your kindness. And I pray, Lord, that right now Your Spirit would meet us with Your comfort and Your truth. We thank You that we're made in Your image. We thank You that we're Your sons and daughters. And I pray that we would... Rest secure today in the life, freedom, and identity we have in Jesus. And it's in His name that we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to take a minute to break now. You might like to stand and stretch, and then I'm going to respond with Stephanie to some of your questions. <laughs> hey, uh, let's put our hands together for Stephanie Jane Judd, Women's Ministry Director at City on a Hill. Much. Joining us to help answer... Some tough questions, no doubt. If God made us in the image and He loves us, why did He make some of us to suffer from gender dysphoria? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the question of of pain and suffering in this world in general, isn't it? And um, and gender dysphoria is is one way in which actually we experience the brokenness Mm. of a world of Genesis 3. You know, Guy unpacked that a little bit in his sermon today and over the last couple of weeks that we stand in Genesis 1, this precious a glorious world that God has created. We also stand in the impact of Genesis 3, the way that sin uh, has affected and impacted our world and our experience in it. And part of that is our bodies and our mind. Uh, And uh, in that is that experience of of the the pain and and the brokenness. And we hold these two intentions, don't we? (coughs) And uh, I think, you know, the, the, the privilege that we have as the body of Christ is to walk alongside one another in, in carrying one another's burdens, you know, feeling one another's sorrows and grieving one another's griefs, in all the different ways that Genesis 3 expresses each mm-hmm. other, itself in each other's lives, and gender dysphoria is one of that. And so God does love us in that, and I think a, a great example or a great demonstration of how He shows His love, of course, is in the person and the power, the love of Jesus Himself, who came 
to bring healing, to bring life, to bring purpose, to bring hope to a world where there is brokenness. And that's the good news of the gospel. Mm, well said. Let's hit the next one. I'm going to read this one out. Yeah. What might the lines... What might the lines between temptation and sin for the struggles of a person facing all this look like? Great. That's a tough question. Thank you. Um, yeah, it, it's obviously a very complicated question because um, it's us for a, uh, you know, I guess a, a, an answer to a varied and complex narrative in terms of individual story. And so, um, it's hard to make a comment on that without knowing the person's story and the individual struggles that they have and how sometimes they feel um, that their dysphoria uh, causes them to respond. So, uh, it, it's true what Stephanie just said there about Genesis 3, that we all uh, carry the, the, the marks of Genesis 3, Genesis 1 and Genesis 3. How we respond to that really is a calling for us each to, to own and will be accountable for. Um, so, uh, that, that, it's very, very difficult to say that. Um, I, I would want to say, and I hope I've, you know, expressed in the story, uh, the sermon, um, that, that, of course, we want to respond uh, in, in trust in God. So, if this is your particular struggle right now, I, I would want you to, 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 to resist the temptation to give up on God, to resist the temptation to think God is against you, uh, to resist the lie that God is not good, uh, that is actually at the heart of Genesis 3, isn't it? I mean, we didn't have time to go into it today, but, you know, the lie of the serpent is really, it's a lie of independence. Um, you can be like God. You can define what is right and what is wrong. You can define these things. That's at the heart of Genesis. It's also, uh, at the heart of it is a rejection of His goodness. And so, I think sin in this moment would be you to give up on God and yield to the world to think God is not for you when actually He loves you, um, that would be my first and that would be my starting point. Yeah, I think that's right. There may be a number of different kind of points along the way in which that might express itself more prominently. So, I don't want to say, you know, at this point, when, you know, the individual has this hormones or this treatment and that's it. You know, I think we need to look fundamentally at what does God call us to and then what does that tell us about sin? God calls us to worship Him, to trust Him, to obey Him, to marvel at His works. The point in which we're, we're doing the opposite uh, would be an expression of sin, you know, actually resisting His sovereignty, His goodness, mm. and, and following our own independence, shaping our own truth. Uh, <coughs> however that's expressed itself will be quite diverse in this situation. But mm. I think answering, asking those deeper questions about who we are and who we're living for is going to be really important there. It seems like there is developing a greater hostility for people who won't affirm someone's gender transition. How can we speak and display God's love to people who refuse to associate with us or are hostile to us if we do not do as they desire? Mm. Yeah, and uh, I, I think developing almost might be an understatement. I mean, it's really quite a strong debate right now um, to the point that if you were to articulate reparative therapy, for example, that's considered, as I said, you know, cruel and unethical and all of these things. And so, uh, some of us will have, have felt that uh, hostility, that's for sure. Um, I think it's important in the discussion to be informed. Um, that's really, really important. Um, I think a good, uh, there's lots of, lots of great uh, literature coming out now. If you're looking for a good uh, book that does a response to activism today, I highly recommend uh, When Harry Became Sally. Uh, it's a great title, but also a great book, um, and uh, I think that'll give you both uh, a, a greater understanding of both the, the, the personal side, but also the political side, and how that's working, and, and all the fundamental reasons that are, are happening there. I just think understanding is really, really important in the debate, uh, because I think on both sides we can, we can fall into ignorance, and that, that doesn't help in the situation. Um, and, and I think uh, love never, never mitigates truth, and truth never mitigates love. And so, uh, I think we want to hold both of those things together. So, you want to be asking the question, how can I love this person? By the, so, how can I, you know, uh, continue to be a person of compassion, compassion, but also conviction? And so, never feeling you should compromise truth. We've got to trust that God's Word is true, and that God's Word is good. Uh, and so, you can do that, but you can do that, I believe, in a way that's, that's loving. And you should also recognize that as a Christian, there is a cost. Um, every culture has had to face challenges for what they believed. 
One generation you know, suffered questions around the Trinity. Another suffered questions about the Lord's Supper. Uh, it feels like one of the particular challenges for our culture today is going to be on gender and identity and, how, and where you stand in that. And uh, it's just helpful to know that being a Christian will come at a cost, and that that cost always comes in different forms and, 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 and expressions. Uh, it may be the case that if you hold to the Bible, you're going to be ridiculed. I mean, that's very obvious today. I mean, not, that's very obvious. If you're a Christian today, you'll seem like a bigot, you'll be called a fundamentalist and all of these kinds of things. So, I think resolving to the fact that in Christ you see one who died for you, um, that Jesus was crucified, should give you an insight of what is going to be true for us all. There's suffering, there's persecution if you're a Christian, but at the same time, as you lay down your life in Christ, He picks it up again. Yeah, great. And I think, you know, just in terms of how we can spray God's love, I think just responding to ridicule with grace, mm. aggression, with gentleness, I mean, that's what the cross displays, doesn't it? You know, the Son of God who faced all the mockery and scorn of the world and yet mm. laid down His life for those who persecuted Him. And so I think as much as possible, while holding on to the truth and living out that character of love and grace and trusting Jesus, there's no reason to be defensive, in the face of opposition and hostility because God is in control and His truth remains. Mm. We're trusting Him. If our identities aren't based on our genders, are there merits to gender-specific church Christian events such as men's conferences? Or a women's and why? conference. I like that you went with men's, actually. Good on you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I, I want to say um, that even though... Uh, our, our identity, perhaps our gender isn't the primary aspect of our identity. I'd say, you know, for those of us who are in Jesus, being in Jesus is the primary aspect of your identity. Uh, I also want to say that uh, gender isn't irrelevant to our identity, that actually gender is incorporated in our identity and that shapes the way that we express ourselves in relationship, in the world, in our family, in the church, perhaps the way that we express ourselves. And, and I think actually that's something we learn from the transgender movement and uh, queer theory is that actually for people who uh, feel like they, uh, what's happening on the inside, what their mind associates is different from their, their body, we actually see that that causes enormous struggle and pain because the, our gender has something significant to say about our identity. Um, for that reason, I think that um, it's excellent to come along to non, uh, I want to say men or women specific uh, conferences but uh, where they happen, um, good to go along to. Great mm. opportunity. I heard there was one to, great uh, one yesterday. I heard there was an excellent one yesterday. Yeah. We had a great time together women, as the women right. of City on Hill. But what I actually loved about that and, and one of what my one of my vision and heart is actually for women's ministry in this church is that first and foremost, uh, we express ourselves as women as we come together and center ourselves on the word of God. You know, that's it's yeah. we, we don't like I think Cupcake making and Lemmingtons are awesome, yeah. um, but our whole expression of womanhood isn't kind of based on events, you know, making those or doing flower arranging. It's based on coming together in Jesus. And so I hope you feel that and know that and know that actually the best way that you can express and celebrate your gender is being a man or being a woman in Jesus. Yeah, it's good. Thank you. I think we've got one last question, Stephanie. Here it comes. Where in the church can a person seek counseling and shelter if they believe they are transgender? Guys. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, it, it, I think a starting point is to say that uh, they could talk to a pastor or someone like Stephanie, who's a women's ministry director here at City on a Hill. We also have a, uh, a, a care pathway. Uh, that's true for anyone at our church who's struggling in life. Um, uh, but if it is the case, and it has been the case for some, uh, that they're seeking shelter and counselling uh, in being transgender, uh, then we'd love to talk with you. We'd love to meet with you. Uh, there are a lot of ways that we try to support as a church. Uh, one of the ways will be in our gospel communities. Uh, we believe people are made for community and there's great strength and love and value in being with other people. Uh, we believe in you know, coming to church on Sundays and hearing the gospel is tremendously important for our health and our well-being. Uh, but we also recognize there are occasions where we want to meet together one-to-one. Our role really will be to help serve you, help work with you, uh, but also, where possible, <coughs> point you uh, to other external uh, professional care as well, to complement 
uh, what we find in the gospel as well. And so, um, thank you for asking this question. Thank you for being brave enough to, to put that up there. And uh, I just want to encourage you, um, if you would be uh, willing to kind of step forward, share that um, in confidence with me or with Stephanie. Uh, we'd love to talk with you more about how we can best support you and serve you in that journey. Stephanie, would you like to pray for us as we close? I would love to. Let's stand and pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for the God that you are, a God of love, a God of power. We thank you that you are our creator, that you are our father, that you are good, that your design for us is good and beautiful and true. Thank you, Lord God, that we are wonderfully and we are fearfully made. I thank you for the honor of that. I thank you for the dignity of that. And I pray, Lord God, that we would be people who know who you are, that we know who we are. Particularly as we look to Jesus, I pray that we will see in him a vision of beautiful humanity, those of us who are men, those of us who are women, I pray that in Jesus we will see the most fundamental, significant aspect of who we are. Those who are in Christ are children of God. And we praise you, Father, for that. And we pray that this week we might go out in the joy of that, in the comfort of that, in the conviction of that, that the world might know your goodness, your truth, your love. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.